are on the Trusting Disruptions page, sponsored by Deltic. Uh, and she introduced all of us. I'm Jacqueline Melnick. I'm with TechCrunch. But if we want to just go down the line and introduce yourselves again. Great. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Joe Miranda. I'm a partner with Cambridge Associates. I run our digital assets investing group. Uh, we're a global investment advisor with about $600 billion under management. Alex Felix, the CIO of CoinFund, uh, one of the leading crypto investment managers in the space. Um, founded back in 2015. Morning, everyone. Uh, Andrew Chen, I'm a portfolio manager uh, on the investment team at Lockheed Martin's Corporate Pension. Good morning, everybody. Uh, Daniel Kim, FBG Capital, uh, one of the directors of investments uh, there. We're a global asset management firm um, doing crypto mining ventures and market making. Hi, yeah, I'm Hugo Rogers. I'm the CIO of Deltec Bank and Trust. So I'm part of the home team. Um, and everybody knows who we are, I hope. <laughs> There we go. Perfect. So I guess to start, can we just get an idea of like how you guys view crypto, especially when it comes to like asset allocation, because that's what the panel is about. I just want to get like a perspective. Um, you know, from our perspective, you know, when you think about it in the context of a diversified portfolio, uh, you know, clients are basically motivated. We put it into portfolios for two reasons. One is it's a disruptive technology and it could either really mess up something you've already invested in, but we also view it as a, a major growth asset. We really view crypto as all of tech as we look forward, um, thinking about new infrastructure to power uh, decentralized applications. Um, it, it's a transition that's really led by consumers and developers that are thinking about how to pioneer their businesses on top of uh, new technologies that they can control. And um, we're, we're looking at just broad-based investments across many of the verticals that are applicable to traditional tech and, um, and how big they can be in the future. Yeah, I mean, we um, technology, not to you know, beat a horse dead, uh, dead horse, but um, you know, and even though it may not neatly fit into a few different types of structures that are typical, um, it's venture-like in sort of risk return uh, conceptually for us. Yeah, it's similar. Um, we're looking at it just as a alternative market, right? Another asset class, um, a different market where there's an innovative disruption happening, and just a whole different type of market on that front. Yeah, we, we're looking at um, allocations into crypto as a kind of parallel portfolio in a multi-asset solution. Um, and I mean, some people talk about um, diversification. Some people from tr traditional finance might talk about CAPM and, and correlations. We don't actually think that's a terribly useful way of looking at it, not least because there isn't the history of data of the correlations, but, but also there's such heterogeneity within crypto itself that actually you could have like an augmented asset allocation within this space, a parallel portfolio, and deliver all the kind of different risk return profiles, um, different length of time, liquidity, and so on within a digital only portfolio. So I think it's um, like an asset allocation augmentation. Um, and uh, I know several of the panel members are actually delivering those solutions. Um, we are participating in those, and, um, and it's been a, a, a good journey to go on. Definitely. So you guys all have like similar but different corners of the market. Uh, what are your clients saying right now in terms of asset allocation this year compared to last year? Like, what has changed? Uh, the biggest change is actually people want to talk to me. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, we started, I started working with uh, client ca deploying capital, client capital pre-crypto winter, and everybody thought I was crazy. Um, and then I promptly lost 50% during the winter, um, and then people were sure I was crazy. Um, and now I'm reasonably confident I'm the most popular person in the firm. Um, and that's, you know, 1,300 people. So, um, yeah, I went from basically zero to 1,300 uh, in the space of a year and a half. So I think it's really just a sign that institutions are, you know, finally taking notice, and they realize there's something. They may not be sure what yet, but everybody is, is focused on this. Yeah, as a crypto manager, I'll kind of play the protagonist here a little bit and sort of give the perspective of what have we seen uh, asset allocators focus on. Um, first is clean structures. Uh, so we really differentiate our platform in having a venture capital practice as well as a, a hedge fund. Uh, but to keep the product simple, you know, focused on where we think there's the best risk reward within crypto and uh, in how to deliver you know, differentiated strategies there, but being able to cover the entire waterfront. Asset allocators want to know that you're seeing uh, as much as you can in the space so that you're selecting 
from uh, the top deals and top entrepreneurs that are coming in to, to build things. And then the last thing is we're seeing uh, kind of a, a big shift in uh, probably, you know, majority family office and high net worth to uh, 60 to 70 percent of, you know, new vehicles being funded by institutions with long-term patient capital. Uh, and we haven't seen them before uh, kind of focus on the underwriting process, which is typically a year, six months, um, it, it's long. And, you know, but they are underwriting for the long term, which is really important for the space, now recognizing that crypto is um, a big part of their venture strategies going forward, um, and that they intend to um, grow their conviction over time in, in, in the asset class. And, and I think that's a material change for, um, you know, sort of the companies that are being founded in, in terms of longevity and potential. Oh, yeah, I mean, um, maybe this isn't exactly the question, but I'm just thinking back to when I first started getting in this space. Uh, I mean, first myself, uh, maybe four years ago, um, which is still young compared to some of my colleagues on this panel. Um, but when I brought it up in conversations internally, I was, I was definitely the weirdo. Um, <laughs> and today, I'm still kind of the weirdo, but... Um, I guess uh, wear it like a badge of honor. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Um, red badge of courage. Um, so it, it's it's. I well, I I can't go into too much detail in terms of what we are doing and not doing, but let's just say um, it's a little. The receptivity is uh, is is better than it was um, earlier, which is not saying much. <laughs> but also, it's like, like, like Felix, what you're saying is, is that <clears throat> the expectations change a little bit, right? Like before in the markets early, people were looking for very high liquid markets and expectations that, hey, we're going to get 100x or 1,000x immediately, right? Now, like a lot of the projects coming in, even the investors are now expecting a, a longer term expectation and putting in more money where now even like the token economics are changing more to the equity stage and looking to build out. And so like I think what we're seeing now is, is that the expectation is now coming more to a you could say a, a digestible or, or expectation on like, look, there's going to be a long-term growth in this space rather than just a short-term, you know, pump in it. Um, so I think that, like, that, that, that drive and interest coming not just from the crypto native folks, but then all across and all across markets are thinking about like, look, like it's not just one sector on the DeFi side, but infrastructure, everything else that what else can be changed. Um, and then you're seeing that now with all these other companies coming in from different industries seeing what else can we do together? Um, kind of, I'd maybe answer the question slightly differently. There's, um, there's lots of venture on the board, um, on, on the panel just now. And, um, and as a sort of multi-asset manager, I can move in, move out, and, and kind of, uh, and choose and, and time exposure. And I would say actually, maybe the other way around, tokens are vulnerable. They look vulnerable here as a liquidity asset, as, um, as, as the NASDAQ is looking softer, as interest rate expectations continue to rise. So actually, I would say there's a kind of a, a shift is what else is there aside from tokens? Is there venture? You know, what, what other, what, what's, what's this yielding and, and staking opportunity? So it's kind of like an understanding that maybe tokens aren't be all and end all. Maybe there is a, a more opportunity and a range of opportunities out there. And I think there's definitely those of other opportunities out there. There are utility functions, things like exchanges you might regard as utilities and banks and so on. So there's, there's a, 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 an understanding that maybe you want to own picks and shovels rather than the gold itself at this point in time. So I would say that that is a, a kind of a more material change. Although I also totally agree with all the, the, the changes in terms of requirement for security and, and, and the maturation of the asset as well. Yeah, it's, it's a good point because like a lot of the funds as well, like they are changing the structure of what they can do in terms of because of what they're seeing from the LPs, right? Like, and you have different types of funds, you know, focuses of being like either just a, a fixed income stable fund working on or focusing on ETFs or so forth. And that's all coming in from a variety of different interests from the LPs themselves. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, the, 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 the risk, the, the risk yeah. profile is, is changing. Exactly. Maybe the volatility is, is dropping away in some asset classes, but it's like there's so... There's such a range of opportunities out yeah. there. It's like dig deep and you're rewarded, I think. I think people know that now. Yeah, for sure. And you guys are talking about like this demand and you went from being weird to less weird. <laughs> and like now people are actually paying attention to this, which is obvious because we have this conference. But what are some of like the concerns or risks that are still out there that either you have or you're hearing? Uh, I'd say there's three. There's two that get some airplay and then there's one that you pretty have, much have to be in the sector to really 
know about it. Uh, the first is simply regulatory. No one really knows. And, um, you know, and that's why we have a bias in favor of things that are you know, on the higher risk return pr profile, because if the regulatory risk applies to every investment, you might as well be like, you're shooting for, like, or hitting for third or fourth, uh, you know, third base or, or home run. Uh, and so regulatory just is still a big unknown, um, and I have no answers for my clients on that one. Um, you know, the second, of course, is environmental, because you know, let's face it, the headlines are really easy to um, you know, create these very divisive, driving you know, uh, uh, click headlines on environmental, in particular electricity usage. And the one that you really don't know about until you're deep enough into it is simply that this is code and things can be you know, poorly written and bad things happen. Uh, so from that perspective, like, the one that I actually think is most concerning is simply that like, it's software and things don't necessarily turn out the way that they were designed. Uh, because of a, an error in the code. And then I think the other two will resolve themselves you know, in relatively short order. I, I think what's really interesting is the risk reward here, is, as you note, um, is so big because of that arbitrage. This, this tech transition is very controversial. Um, and many of the prior transitions from web one to web two haven't been as controversial other than maybe IBM uh, mentioning that you should keep your servers in your office and not move to the cloud for longer than they should have. Um, it, but it, why is this one controversial? Because it's not top-down driven. So you're not having, you know, the people on the stage here are not from Apple, Microsoft, and, and you know, the fangs telling you this is about to happen in tech. Um, this is really bottoms up, you know, as I mentioned, kind of consumer and developer driven. And so you have a, a big arbitrage between, you know, half the people of the world don't think that crypto is going to be the bedrock of the new internet. Uh, so you're getting paid for a lot of these risks, right, from regulatory, um, to, to the others. And, and another one I'd, I'd like to throw in the mix here is, is adoption. Uh, so consumer adoption of crypto is dangerous. Uh, these are bearer assets. You're in control of your own data and it needs to be done thoughtfully and it needs to be, it needs to come from some of the big tech companies that will be responsible for the aggregation of um, underlying protocols. So the best prime broker, you know, DeFi protocol that will be unleashed as the world's prime broker through you know, PayPal or Facebook or Venmo applications, um, because it can just be connected to through open source code, uh, they have to do that responsibly. You know, you need to teach people about um, non -two me text message 2FA. Um, so there's a lot of education here and a lot of risk in how do we roll out the benefits of Web3 and the, you know, self-sovereign nature of all your data uh, paired with the risks that, um, that that entails for billions of people where the longer tail, the next incremental user of crypto uh, does not have the risk tolerance of an early adopter or someone who is speculating on NFTs or even someone who has made a business um, you know, in the space. So that, that's a big risk. Um, and you know, it's not one that allocators mentioned to us a lot. Um, but yeah, curious to, to get you know, your perspective, Andrew. Yeah, I mean, um, don't have a too much to add from, you know, Joe, Joe talks to a lot of uh, my peers and whatnot. Um, but something, I, I think you actually brought up a really good point, Alex. Uh, this is maybe the first asset class that retail got to first um, and benefited greatly. Uh, and and I, think that <laughs> I think for better or for worse, um, when you're sort of an institution and left out in the cold and you're like, oh, a bunch of, you know, internet cartoon characters are <laughs> making millions. This, this can't be real, like this is garbage. Um, and so it takes a, a bit of sort of like a, like a psychological or mental shift to, to be, as I used the phrase yesterday, be ready to see the matrix. Um, and, you know, an example of that is sometimes uh, talking to some colleagues uh, in the early days, you, when, I mean, everyone here spent so much time looking at the space, you forget kind of what it was like before. And so, you know, when you say token, I mean, maybe we think DeFi, maybe we think whatever, uh, they think Doge. And, you know, no disrespect to Doge millionaires and, and whatnot, but it's, it's a totally different conversation to have um, on that front. But, you know, circling back to, to the points about security and, and uh, being bearer assets, that's, that's not sort of a, I mean, I actually think that is one of the central kind of innovations. Uh, and I, I also think maybe it's a different conversation, but it's interesting that sometimes we want to shove it back into a box, AKA the Bitcoin ETF, but different conversation. Um, but, uh, but yeah, getting, getting that kind of um, behavioral shift uh, and understanding 
understanding the fact that you can hold these, uh, uh, you know, figuratively hold these assets is, is a, a big mental leap for a lot of uh, colleagues and peers. Yeah, I mean, like, look, we're, we're at the, the reality is, is we're still very early, right? I mean, and it, like, even though it's been about, what, seven to 10 years, even each market is still very early, right? Like we had the crypto market, like Bitcoin and so forth, back in 07 to like 09 to like, you know, 2014. And then DeFi really got big in 2020. And that's like a whole separate market, right? And different community and different like, you know, contracts and so forth. And then you have the NFT market. Now, the reality is, is like when, you're, when we're setting expectations with our LPs and everybody else, it's like, look, like there's a lot of risk in terms of the ambiguity of unknowns of what's happening within the market, um, what to expect. There's still smart contract risk. The reality is it's like, you know, there still is going to be hiccups in the space, but the, the amount of participants that are coming in, trying to fix and trying to develop, and the amount of capital to help try to build and refix everything, is there. Um, so I think that's like a still a common thing. Um, maybe just to be sort of a, take a slightly different tack, and I know there's a lot of conversation about regulation and the, and the, the genesis of regulation. I, I like to think of ourselves being in a slightly privileged position because I work for a small, flexible, dynamic organisation that people hopefully know. Um, and uh, in a small, flexible, dynamic jurisdiction. So, in other words, we can, we can move forward in, in a way and, and make our allocations and consider all the products without having to, 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 to be too laborious in terms of the conversation. So, so that's, that's good. That's from a, from a Dell Tech point of view. But, um, but also from the broader regulatory point of view, it's, I mean, look, what, look what's going on around us here, the intellectual capital. The, the, uh, the actual capital involved, the momentum in the space, you can see early parts of regulation being relatively easy, perhaps. Uh, you know, consumer protections being key and so on. So uh, I think that, that maybe regulation is, I hope it's a, a, a rolling stone that gathers no more, so I'm, I'm less worried uh, about that. I do think that the point made about where, it's, where this whole space has come from, where you know, the, the retail investor being being an early adopter um, and, and sort of that genesis, that means that there are kind of lots of uns, unseen vulnerabilities and I would highlight things like sort of excess leverage, um, maybe on people's personal balance sheets. I would, you know, there's, there, there are vulnerabilities and I use that to then, if I still have mic, <laughs> maybe I do, maybe I don't. But anyway, um, <laughs> I can use yours again. Um, I, uh, I, I would highlight that you know, in a world where liquidity is actually moving out, there will be vulnerabilities. You know, there will be vulnerabilities to, to liquid investments, but there will be vulnerabilities in illiquid investments as well. So that's a kind of a, a broad, broad um, worry that um, maybe people should have in their minds. Yeah, there's a big talk right now of like, it's all about when, not if anymore. I keep hearing that during this conference. And um, in terms of like actual allocation, I think the average is like 5% of someone's portfolio. What do you think it's going to take to get that higher? Should that number be higher? Or do you think it's fair that it's anywhere from like 0.1% to 20%? Well, I would say that you know, most client, in the context of 600 billion of assets, um, you know, we're, you know, it's, it's across that 600, it is tiny. Um, you know, the clients that I started working with, the, those portfolios early on, you know, they're north of 10%, and they're definitely the outliers on institutional allocations. Um, but they also have the benefit of deploying capital during the crypto winter, and you know, it was... What percentage do you think is zero? Uh, the, vast, uh, the vast majority, exactly. yeah, okay. of institutions globally, yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I think most everybody is now just trying to make their first investment, and so they are literally starting out you know, with like, and it is a abnormally small investment. <laughs> um, to the point where you're sort of like it's a rounding error actually in their reporting. Um, but they have to start somewhere um, and it's only after they get comfortable uh, in the context of their total portfolio and they understand this. this is the, most of the investments, I mean I, I imagine Alex you get this where people are like you're our first investment, I'm not putting words in your mouth but I'm putting words in your mouth, um, <laughs> where they just like we want you to help us understand this, this sector and that's exactly the way that, that I work with, with you know, our client portfolios where it's, you have to start somewhere and I would say that you know, if, if you make somebody, uh, if you really had to come up with sort of a range of initial targets, it's half a percent to 2% is where they begin. But the reality is that that could easily become 4 or 5% you know, in the right market uh, environment very, very quickly. Um, and with the volatility levels that this sector has, the impact on your portfolio of a 5% allocation that maybe has like 35 to 55% standard deviation 
is extreme. And so it has the impact of like a 10 or a 12 or a 15 percent traditional uh, asset allocation, which is a really long answer to say that um, I think everybody's still echolocating on the right number. Um, but I would say that most every uh, uh, portfolio begins at sort of like a half a percent to 2 percent as sort of their initial target. And then once they get comfortable, they will start to think about it in the context of you know, total asset allocation. But can't you manage that volatility? In other words, you can use different, different uh, not, not tokens at all, but, but different investments to change that volatility profile. So actually, you can lift your allocation I mean, to a very significant level without actually blowing out your return prof risk return profile for, for clients. So actually, the maturity is kind of pick a number. It's like wh wh whether you think it's the future or not. Some of the folks that, that we talk to, at least, they think about more on the cost basis. Um, so it's like how much have they yeah, total allocated to this space. Yeah. Yeah. They use the data point of what's my mark to market, you know, what's my ex overall exposure as a helpful barometer for am I looking for new managers? Mm -hmm. you know, so th they're going to commit to those that they're committed to. They're going to you know, re-up with them um, if they're continuing to show good progress in generating some of those returns that you know, people have been excited about. Um, but I, I don't hear as many focused on, I'm, I'm just way too overexposed. And if, if that's the case, that's you know, really just a small cohort of, um, of, of what we're dealing with. What, what I think is important, though, is this is all venture risk. Outside of Bitcoin, Ethereum, and Coinbase, everything's less than five years old. Mm -hmm. And you know, it, it's really hard to say this should be 1% or this should be 5%. But people need to think about you know, what their kind of discretionary, you know, high risk, high octane reward bucket looks like, whether that's part of your venture allocation or, um, you know, just a, a discretionary, you know, piece of alternatives that you have in your portfolio. That's the way to think about it. Um, you know, I think everyone in crypto now has gotten quite comfortable that that percentage is really, really high. And um, that's from a, you know, crypto fund manager perspective. But the, the, the depth and diversity of the markets now really do feel like you're getting exposure to um, a number of different trends, a number of different verticals, and a number of different stages that are, uh, that, that are very similar to, to how, you, uh, how you've looked at private investing across many markets. That could be you know, credit strategies where you're you know, lending money on, on protocols and generating 10% looks very much like you know, the business development company, um, you know, private credit world I came from, um, you know, before I started CoinFund and, and, and private equity. Um, we're using massive leverage to generate some of your returns. Um, you, you have, you know, service provision companies that are servicing massive ecosystems and government providers and banks. These people will have to face the problem of dealing with digital assets and they will have to uh, have these services. So, like, the, 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 that's a really sticky um, you know, customer base. You have NFTs, which in their second year in existence are as large as the global art market, um, you know, at $40 billion of, of sales. Um, all of IP, you know, might transition to you know, NFT ownership structures again. Um, you have, you know, DeFi, uh, a lot of the infrastructure. So, so I think that the diversity of how you invest in the space, the liquid markets as well, um, gives you uh, a, a much better kind of exposure opportunity than just um, you know, thinking about this all being binary and this all being, you know, highly volatile um, when you look out over the longer term. Yeah, I mean, to build off that point, you know, I've, so I was at a conference last week that was crypto focused, but mostly from an LP and investor uh, side, um, less from a builder and manager side. And, you know, the point I was making to folks was, you know, at this point, it's like you, if you have one person solely focused on uh, crypto, that's not enough to really be, you know, educated. You could have one person solely focused on like, maybe not Solana NFTs, but, you know, just like there are already crazy, uh, crazy levels of specialization that you can do, you know, across DeFi, NFTs, um, and then each base layer, and, and then it can get really crazy. So, um, got to do your homework. And I think uh, if you're going back to the original question in terms of, of um, how much to allocate, I mean, that's kind of up to you uh, as, as the investor in your level of, of comfort and your understanding of risk um, in the space, you know, maybe to, uh, to uh, copy what I think Novo has said. Um, if if 0.5% of global wealth is in crypto and you have no exposure, then you're, you're short that in sort of your, uh, your benchmark. I mean, that 
seems like a little bit of a FOMO way to, to uh, explain your allocation, but it's, um, it's, it's something to think about. And it's, it's not just, I mean, I, I used the example before, it's not just Dogecoin, um, and it's not, uh, I feel like the, as a skeptic, you can cherry pick the example you want to say, oh, well, this is all you know, a waste of time. But if you actually dig in and, and kind of see what's happening, then I think those with a critical mind will be a little bit more receptive. So. Andrew, one question for you. So SBF said he thinks $2 trillion come into the, the space. I, I think that's directionally right yeah. over the next you know, five to 10 years. Um, what, do, what do you think about that number? That's my job. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think about that? <laughs> all right. Um, over the next 10 years, uh, maybe, maybe I've drank too much Kool-Aid, but like, if we're talking about this as being so transformative on every level, that to me feels low. Yeah. Um, I mean, where are we right now? A little less than tr trillion, 40% um, of that roughly is, is Bitcoin and 20% of that is ETH. Um, and you know, there's, there's probably in similar conversations you've had about NFTs, it's like NFTs are, just a fraction of total crypto market cap, but to fulfill all the vision that you're talking about, even getting part, part way there, that's supposed to be way more than total crypto market cap today. So I don't know what you want to lump into it, but if you just call all of it, um, two trillion over 10 years seems like we've quote failed. It feels like it's whether the use cases actually get accepted and proliferate. If there's one use case which is really embedded, which is BTC as store of value and you know, to be honest, that's not even secure yet because it, there's a movement with NASDAQ and liquidity right now. So that, that question is still not totally settled, but it's more settled than any other question. Then you have to see whether these other use cases, so Web 3.0, smart contracts, NFTs, whether these use cases actually bed in, proliferate and move into the mainstream in a way, then I totally agree. The number may well be underbaked. Yeah. And, um, you know, before I forget, uh, Examples like, I mean, we're, we're very, fo we talk about financialized uh, use cases, but, you know, neither support or uh, against, but just um, stuff like Helium or Hive Mapper or some of these things that, that leverage uh, the token kind of concept, but tie it to sort of, quote, real world use cases. Uh, I think we're sort of at the tip of the iceberg there. Um, we are very interested to see what happens. Cool. Um, I guess one of my questions I had for you guys, because you all have been in this space for like different amounts of time, uh, you could take this towards asset allocation or you could take it however you like, but what has been like one of your biggest like aha moments working in this space? I got to think about that. Aha. I had, I had one uh, the other day where uh, we were interviewing an 18 year old and um, <laughs> You know, she, she said, I, I have a question for you. Why, why is everyone I'm interviewing with so old? <laughs> <laughs> and, you, you know, what I realized is, um, you know, yes, we're crypto boomers now and, and you know, we need to recognize that. Uh, but that there is a generation of people um, that, that we're hiring and working with now that underwrite code. And that's all they've known how to do. Um, so we have, you know, a lot of us up here that have made the transition from understanding the corporate finance toolkit, understanding, you know, traditional finance, you know, valuation, how to think about new business models. And then there, there's a rising tide of, um, of, of young folks coming through college. Um, you know, one of our uh, technical analysts, he, you know, did three internships in college and in, in crypto startups and crypto funds, joined us full time after he graduated. And like this is, you know, what he does is underwrite code and he understands the big risk there in, you know, how we're rewiring a lot of the systems that we're going to use. And, and but it, it's a new breed of um, skill set that was not taught on Wall Street. It will be created in crypto here. Um, and I think it's going to be really powerful um, in many ways going forward. And so I, I think one of the big aha moments for me is like recognize how important this sector is uh, from a jobs creation, from a um, opportunity set for our youth, um, and to you know do our best to be good stewards of um, of using this innovation practically and um, and 
in, in ways that benefit um, you know, the, the world because it is one of the few threads, I think, in a, in a uh, you know, macro environment that we have today you know, with the war in Ukraine and others that will keep globalization together. You know, crypto networks are being adopted globally um, all over the world, day one, um, and, and math is uh, global language. Um, so I think it, it, it is a really interesting nexus of what's important to our next generation, uh, elucidated through a, a conversation I had with an 18-year-old who told me uh, everyone is old. <laughs> uh, can I just add to that, because it's the same, slightly the same point that I want to make. It's like meeting young people whose whole like, financial existence is actually like on chain. <laughs> and and I, I mean, I'm a bit older than that, so I, you know that that whole like the, the trust in the system is so complete with a cohort that it, that was a surprise, a bit of an aha moment for me you know, a few years ago, realizing that people wanted to be paid, wanted to make all their payments, just just wanted to live that digital life, digital financial life, and um, I think I, that's that's quite amazing because you know that there's the future in front of you potentially. And maybe bringing those two points together, or the previous point. Um, you know, I was, I was at an event, um, I don't know if you're familiar with Matthew Ball, uh, but he writes a lot on metaverse and, and pretty, pretty cogent thoughts. Um, he made the point that basically we ain't seen nothing yet and that the 2020s are where a lot of, uh, you know, non skeuomorphic business models come into play because this is the generation of kids who grew up playing Roblox and Minecraft and all these things. Um, then they become adults and make money and, and, you know, in a sort of gamified existence um, or in terms of how they interact. Um, this, is, this is stuff that's probably going to blow all of our minds as uh, crypto boomers. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I am continually surprised at my complete inability to predict what will be the next hot thing. Um, and so I think my aha moment is I actually have no idea other than I know that there's this meta wave and it's probably over the next 30 years, and as long as you have broad exposure, you will catch whatever is the moment. But you know, DeFi summer, no one thought NFTs would be where we are today, and everybody assumed that DeFi would be still you know, the hot thing, and then NFTs come out of nowhere. And you can even break it down into like, what's hot within NFTs. So I think my aha moment simply is that I, I have no clue <laughs> what's going to be hot, and w other than that, blockchain is fundamentally disruptive and it's disintermediating and it's going to shake everything up. And the fascinating thing for me about it is that the young people or anybody here who's here is just here because they love the idea of what it has the potential to do. When you think about it in the context of like the day jobs that are out there and people are just going into work because or working from home because it's nine to five and you get paid for it and blah, blah, blah. They're just doing what they have to do to eat. And this is a space where everybody's doing it because they love it. And it's just a fundamentally much more fun place to be than sort of in the real world where everybody is just showing up because they kind of have to. Yeah. And I think what we're all seeing is like, there's just different communities coming in, right? Like the NFT market, what I realized was like the NFT market is completely different of the community versus like the DeFi community versus like the Bitcoin community. Everything is very different. And you're also seeing like this whole growth in, in changes of, of like, you know, who's coming in. And so it's, you can't really say it's like, you know, one's gonna be a maximalist or not, it's just that there's always gonna be a, a new community that may come out from the younger kids or any next generation. That's just the whole change that you can't expect and, and see. All right, maybe this is for everyone but Joe, because Joe said he can't predict the future, but <laughs> wait, this is my last question. Like, what's next for asset allocations, portfolios, whatever it may be, like, what's the future gonna look like? What do you guys think? Oh, well, that is easy, uh, a lot more. <laughs> In the portfolios, yeah, and, and we'll be up to, yeah, I think that 5% <laughs> is going to be very realistic in the next couple of years. There we go. <laughs> uh, <laughs> circle back to me. I, I, I don't know what's next in asset allocation, but I can talk about what's next in crypto. <laughs> um, I don't know if this is necessarily a, a profound thought, but I think one thing that really is missing in the institutional kind of approach to crypto Broadly speaking, there are a handful who have bucked the trend, but hey, well, we are going to be long ETH or long base layers or long, like, long the space for, for a, well, the overused term, for a long period of time. Um, because I was thinking about this, it, it seems like a lot of the zeitgeist right now is around VC um, because it's sort of like a structure and a concept that folks are used to. 
But um, you know, where are these projects going to exit into? They're going to exit into the token markets, and <laughs> um, there's got to be like a, a sustained, strong hand, um, I think, to to bid this stuff. Um, and I think that potentially is where some of this might evolve to, or I hope it is, um, so so that the space can grow broadly. Yeah, I guess on my side, it's you know. We've kind of seen this past year, like 3.0 being validated. You have all the crypto native guys validating and coming in. Now you're kind of seeing in the next phase, maybe it's going to be like a 2.5, kind of like a revert back of getting that infrastructure and that bridge to get the mass market to come in. And this is kind of where you're seeing that, that structure being changed, not just in token economics, but more equity coming in because these are longer term projects that are going to develop out and, and grow out until like, you know, two to three years. And it's going to be that bridge to, you know, Value. How do we get that mass market to come in as the next phase of crypto? I, I guess just to or go for it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, just to add one, one thing. Um, when when people have been focused on the VC markets is kind of the defensible way to um, you know bet early on crypto projects. Um, and I wanted to tee this one up for Hugo before I, uh, I, I passed it off to him. But one area that institutional investors are still very uncomfortable is in the liquid token markets. Um, and despite all the fear that everyone has that you know, Ethereum at a $300 billion network valuation, is that right? Similar to like how, how you look at Amazon today when you strip out AWS um, and, and these networks can potentially be you know, that big and that powerful as we look forward. Will there be four you know, operating systems? Um, you know, we, we, we have a couple today and, and, and I think the market might consolidate a little bit, but there will be some really core operating systems out there. Um, and, and so a lot of the institutional money has gotten comfortable with the venture capital strategies uh, because they, um, you know, are cash in, cash out. Um, you know, they're, they're keeping investor classes, um, you know, very aligned in the, in the interests of um, how they're monetized in the future. Uh, but, but I think that we're just starting to see um, allocators and, and the, let's say the top ranks of those allocators understanding nomenclature in crypto. So that is, you know, what is a token? What is a blockchain? You know, how do we strip this all away and say like tokens are integral for um, governance, monetization, and security? And that's important. You know, to owning a crypto network, you must own the, the token or the digital asset. So, I, 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 if I'm to call anything that's a little bit controversial, I actually think there will be a lot more participation from institutions in the liquid side of the markets, um, kind of supporting what we think might be you know, inflated valuations today, uh, but could actually be quite undervalued in the future. Yeah, that's, um, that's really nice. And um, so I, I'd actually agree with that. It's like you get to a point in time where the heterogeneity within tokens can actually start coming through. So correlations can go down. We might see some winners, some losers within certain use cases and so on. So that is potentially the next big thing, being able to identify quickly, I don't know, picking winners is maybe a bit of a mugs game, but, but identify quickly the changes that are happening in trying to get uh, ahead of that uh, within, let's say, tokens or within the different opportunity sets. But I'd also, uh, I, I had one lined up, so I, I'm, I'm totally in agreement, but I would also come back to that regulatory point as well. If there is regulation, if, there, if there's momentum behind the regulation, particularly out of the States, because that's, that's where it really matters, and there is momentum here, there's momentum in this building, yeah, which everybody knows about. So if that, if that regulation comes through, then you have a, a potential step change. I don't know when it's going to be, but that step change is, again, it's um, elephants getting through a narrow corridor into a crowded room. Prices can move all over the place at that point in time. So that's maybe one to watch out for as well as the next thing in asset allocation. Great. Thank you guys so much for joining us on stage. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.